A um, little strange, I know, with uh, us taking a week off last week, you know, we had our Easter Sunday service two weeks ago, and um, this series is supposed to be a continuation of what we started on Easter Sunday, um, and it's a short series, it's only going to last four weeks altogether, um, and as you saw on the screen, the title of the series is Love Reigns, and like I said, it's a continuation of what we started on Easter Sunday, because two weeks ago, when we were here together, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the reason that we celebrate it is because his resurrection, his victory over death, is proof that he really is the true king over everything. And so I always look forward to Easter when we get a chance to celebrate that specifically. And we committed during that service to live under the reign of Jesus' love so that we can be more like he is. And so today, even though we had to take a break last week, we're going to continue on in this series. And we're going to talk today about how God's love reigns over our past. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of his work on the cross, we don't have to be controlled by the mistakes and the miscues and the things that happened in our lives a long time ago, things in our past. Many of us, unfortunately, do allow those things to control us and allow those things to hinder us today because a lot of people believe that their past is a hindrance to their present and to their future. They just can't get over some of the things that have happened in their past. And it can be a heavy burden for people to bear when you feel weighed down by previous choices that you've made. And so um, we're going to talk about that today. Now, just by way of illustration, even though this doesn't really apply to our lives, Um, One area where the past can have difficult consequences, and again, this is just by way of illustration only, is the area of sports. And I want to talk about a couple of instances in sports because almost every sport on earth has these stories about these teams or franchises or organizations that have had bad luck, if you believe in bad luck, that has bad luck because of their past. And two of those stories involve baseball teams, Um, who went many, many years without ever winning a World Series title. One of those two teams was one of our local teams, the Chicago Cubs, and that's one of the two stories I want to tell this morning. But I want to go to the other one first, and I want to tell the story of another team, which was the Boston Red Sox. And when you go back to the early part of the 1900s, you'll find out that the Boston Red Sox was one of the most successful baseball teams around. They won World Series titles in 1912, and then they skipped a couple of years, and they won back-to-back titles in 1915 and 1916, skipped a year in 1917, and then won another World Series title in 1918. So they won four championships, four World Series titles in the span of seven years, last one being 1918. Then 1919 came along. Anybody know who this guy is, this picture? Babe Ruth, Ruth, that's right. Anybody know they call it the curse of something for the Red Sox? Anybody know what the curse was called? Yes, the curse of the Bambino because that's the nickname that Babe Ruth had. Well, a lot of people don't remember that Babe Ruth was with the Boston Red Sox. And In 1919, Harry Frazee, who was the owner of the Boston Red Sox, he made the decision to sell Babe Ruth to the Yankees. And so there's a lot of fans, a lot of Boston Red Sox fans, that think that that was the decision that caused this curse of the Bambino. Because what happened to the Boston Red Sox was after 1919, they went 86 years without a World Series championship. Remember, they won four in seven years, then they traded away Babe Ruth, and then they went 86 years without a World Series championship. It wasn't until 2004 that that quote-unquote curse was finally broken. So for 86 years, Boston Red Sox fans bore this burden, believing that they could never get past this mistake that had been made in their past. Here's the one that you guys know better. This was the curse of the Chicago Cubs. What's this curse? What's the name of this curse? 
Billy go, okay, that's right. So put the next slide up. So here's the story with this. Actually, there's different stories about this when you go and read it. And so I don't know whether this is the accurate story or not. But when I went back and looked at this, because when you look at the Chicago Cubs, even before the Boston Red Sox were as successful as they were, the Cubs were more successful before the Boston Red Sox. In 1906, Chicago Cubs posted the highest regular um, season win total ever recorded um, in Major League history, ever since they expanded to 154 games. Highest regular season win total, highest winning percentage in the history of Major League Baseball. And in that postseason, 1906, they made it to the World Series and they played, anybody know? Aaron? They played the White Sox. Yeah, they played their crosstown rivals in 1906. Only World Series that's ever been played between the two Chicago baseball teams. The Cubs lost that series to the White Sox four games to two, but they came back and they won back-to-back -back World Series titles in 1907 and 1908, first team ever to uh, win back-to-back -back World Series titles, and they were also the first team to play in three consecutive World Series. And then between 1908 and 1945, they won the National League pennant six additional times. Very successful franchise. Never won another World Series during that time. But then 1945 happened with this. And according to the story, a guy by the name of William Cianis, who was the owner of Billy Goat Inn and later became Billy Goat Tavern in Chicago, he always brought his pet goat to the games. He'd come to the Cubs games and he'd bring his pet goat with him. And so here it is, 1945, the World Series, and game four of the World Series, the Cubs were ahead of the Detroit Tigers, two games to one, and here comes William Cianis with his goat to the game, and they wouldn't let him in. They would not let the goat through, and so they turned the goat away at the gate, according to one version of the story, and so Cianis went out and tied him to a stake out in the parking lot, and he went into the game without the goat. His pet goat's name was Murphy, and supposedly when it was tied up out in the parking lot, it was bothering some fans. And so they asked Sianus to leave and attend to his goat. And so he placed a curse on the Chicago Cubs because of that incident. And the Cubs didn't play in another World Series for the next 71 years until the curse was finally broken in 2016 when they defeated the Cleveland Indians. But they went 108 years after their last World Series win before they won again. So the curse of the billy goat. Now there's a lot of other legends about bad luck that's based on the past. You've heard maybe of the Madden curse or the Sports Illustrated cover curse. And they're all just interesting stories because that's what they are. There's no such thing as curses, you know, but they're all interesting stories. And the reason that I tell you those stories is because there are so many people that believe that's why it took so long for the Boston Red Sox to win or why it took so long for the Chicago Cubs to win. They believe that because of these mistakes that had been made in their past, they were destined to not win another World Series title. And just like with those sports stories, we can all look at things in our past, right? I mean, we can all look to maybe one or two decisions that we've made in our past that we have some trouble living down. Some decisions we make are just honest mistakes that don't have many consequences. Others can have some pretty devastating effects in our lives for many, many years. And even though we can't change our past, and a lot of us would like to change some of the things about our past, what we can do is through Jesus Christ, we can ensure that our past doesn't control our present and it doesn't control our future. If you spend any time at all reading your Bibles, especially the Gospels, you're going to see lots of stories about individuals that have had these shady pasts, is probably the best way to put it, and they have this fresh start. They experience this fresh start because of their interactions with Jesus Christ. How many of you have been watching a series called The Chosen? Show of hands. The Chosen. Okay, a few of you. I would highly encourage you to watch this series. It's in the second season. They've put three episodes out now. But it's like this fresh look of what Jesus' life was about. They intend to make seven seasons of it. And it's really a good story. But what you see, especially in this last episode, um, episode three of season two, is you see these people, the disciples. And it's like 
they struggle with their lives and the things of their past and their personalities, yet they're following Jesus, you know, and you see over the course of this series how their lives were changed. And, you, t- you know, when you look at Scripture, the New Testament speaks about this a lot. It speaks about this transforming power of Christ in our lives. When he did what he did, when he sacrificed himself on the cross, and when he rose from the grave on the third day, he makes that available to all of us. And when people place their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, you know, we call it salvation, right? We call it being saved, being born again. When we do that, we are instantly different. We're instantly changed and we're forgiven and we're made completely new again is what scripture tells us it's the greatest news of all of the decisions that we'll ever make in our lives and things that we look at in our past that have caused such guilt and shame it can all be nullified by what Jesus Christ did on the cross and the love that he shows for every single one of us Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 so if you got your Bibles with you Um, I would ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to start in verse 17. I'm going to read a few verses, but I'm going to start in verse 17 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I'll give you a second to get there. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Okay, here's what God had to say through the Apostle Paul. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And notice Paul sets this verse up with the word therefore. So if you were to go back before this verse, what you'll find is that you'll find Paul bragging about God's amazing love that would offer Jesus' life as a sacrifice to rescue our life. And so he puts the word therefore as the connector between that and what he says here. And so he's saying, therefore, it's because of God's love that we are who we are in Christ, that we're new creations. And when you look at that phrase in Christ, that's used so many times in the New Testament. In fact, it's used maybe a couple hundred times just in Paul's letters alone. And it's this way of showing connection between us and Jesus. It's this union between us and Jesus. And when we're united with him because of our faith in him, what we experience is we experience a transformation that makes us new. And all of you who are believers can attest to that. I bet every single one of you, if I were to talk to you, if I were to bring you up here and interview you, and I would say, tell me about what Christ has done to you, for you, you would tell me that my life has changed because of what's happened with my relationship with Jesus. And, and so in order for that newness to be a reality, the old has to be removed. And according to this passage of scripture, the old things are passed away. And so my first point for today's message is simply this. Um, it's out with the old and in with the new. Out with the old and in with the new, because the love of God and what Jesus did on that cross removes all of the old sin. It removes the shame and the guilt and the mistakes and the failures from our lives. And when we allow God's love to reign in our lives, it should overpower the hold that all of those old things used to have in our lives. But it has to be cleaned up and space has to be made for those new things that God wants to do in us. When I grew up as a kid, I grew up in a little town called Alexandria, Indiana. Most of you have heard me talk about Alexandria. Little town, about 7,000 residents when I was there. We moved there in 1965. I was five years old. And when we moved to Alexandria, my dad bought this old, abandoned, two-story house. I mean, it was a pretty creepy house. It sat in the main street of town. It had been abandoned for years. And when my dad bought it, The place was, honestly, it was falling down is what it was. All the windows were broken out of it. The grass was about this tall all around the thing. And my dad had done these odd jobs for a couple of elderly ladies in Alexandria. And so he'd been working part-time for them, and they owned this house, and he bought it from them. I think, if I remember right, he bought this house for $2,000. A huge house, 14 rooms, I mean, big old house, right there, like I said, right there on the main street of town. 
And it, like I said, it said abandoned for years and years. And so my dad would go to Alexandria after he finished his shift at Westinghouse. He worked at a factory in Muncie. And he'd finish his shift at Westinghouse, and then he'd drive over to Alexandria, and he'd work on remodeling that house to make it livable for us to move into. And there's a lot of days that I would go with him and uh, do the menial jobs that he wanted to do. I mean, he tore all the lath and plaster off all the walls and put up drywall and put in new kitchen and bath fixtures, re-roofed the house, put up, I mean, did all kinds of stuff to it. And so me and my brother would go and help. Um, didn't learn a whole lot from it, but because I was more interested in going outside and playing. But, you know, he worked on that house and he worked on it faithfully for about six months. And after about six months of work, it was okay for us to move into. And it was actually a work in progress for the next 15 years that we lived there before we sold it. But here's what's interesting about it. I mean, I didn't really care for that house when I was growing up because it just seemed like it was old and run down and I was sort of embarrassed by it, to tell you the truth, as a kid. But my dad could see the potential in that house. I mean, he looked at that house, and he saw what that old house could be. And so he could look past the plaster and the rotten wood and all the cracked linoleum floors, and he could see what it would look like if it was new. I couldn't see that. To me, it was just work is what it was. But my dad could see that. And so he worked very hard on that house for many, many years to make it what he envisioned that it would be. Um, another example of that that I could think of when I was putting this message together is when Judy was alive, and I still do this sometimes, but we used to watch HGTV. How many of you watch HGTV? Okay. We used to watch HGTV. We'd watch the shows where you'd go and buy houses but we'd also watch the ones where they'd remodel old houses. One of our favorites was Fixer Upper. Chip and Joanna Gaines, you know, they were famous because of this show. You know, he made uh, Demo Day famous. That was his thing, you know, getting into that house and tearing all the old stuff out so that he could put new material in. And, you know, those of you that remodel houses, you probably know exactly what that's like because you do the same thing, right? You do Demo Day. Just like my dad did with that house, and just like Chip Gaines did on Demo Day, you know, when God comes into our lives, he doesn't just overlook our sinful past. What he does is he forgives it completely. And not only does he forgive it, he removes it so that it doesn't have any power over us anymore. So when we confess our past to Jesus, we are then allowed to experience this radical forgiveness that he offers us. And when we confess, that means we're just agreeing with God. And so what we're doing is we're acknowledging our old sinful ways, and we're acknowledging that it's just what Scripture says, that it's old and outdated. And we agree to allow God to replace those sinful ways with godly ways that are new and better. It's one of the great things, the great um, demonstrations of a true commitment that you have to Jesus Christ as you see him starting to remove those old things and you see new things happening in your life. We do things, I mean, I've shared this about myself. I used to, you know, and most people can't believe this, but I used to have a pretty foul mouth when I was at work. I would say things that I shouldn't say. And, you know, when I was saved, February of 2001, God removed that from me instantly. I, don't, I mean, it was a miracle to me. I mean, I'd go to work and my language was completely different because God changed me. You know, he takes us from telling lies to speaking the truth, from being selfish to being selfless, from spreading gossip to offering encouragement to other people, from being angry and burning with anger to being filled with joy. That's what God does in our lives. And so when we remodel a house, you know, it's important to get all of that old stuff out of the way, the old and, and rotten pieces, and replace it with new and fresh materials, because if you don't take out the old, it's going to come back to haunt you one of these days in the future. And in the same way, when we try to live as a new creation, but we still hold on to the things of our past, we still can't let go of those things, the only thing we end up doing is we end up being frustrated and our relationship with God and our relationship with other people will always suffer because we have to submit 
to his lordship. We have to allow God to remove all of it, you know, and start us with this fresh and renewed heart and instill inside of us this desire to live for him constantly, like the passage of scripture that I shared from Psalm 71 earlier. Let me share another passage from Psalm 103, verse 12. You don't need to turn there. Stay in 2 Corinthians. But in Psalm 103, 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, our sins, from us. So listen, folks. I mean, if you've got things in your past that still haunt you and things that you're hanging on to, we don't have to walk around. As believers, we don't have to walk around defeated. We don't have to walk around full of shame anymore. If you truly are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you can be confident in the fact that you've been forgiven. Everything, past, present, and future, it's gone, and it's been removed as far as the east is from the west because Scripture says we're a new creation. And so our past should not have control over our present or our future. And if you're hanging on to it, you need to take it to God and have him give you the strength to let go of those things that are still haunting you from your past. That passage of scripture that I opened with, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it goes on and says this, 18, 19, and 20. It says, now, meaning now that we're a new creation, now that the old things have passed away, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. All of that, folks, that's all a gracious gift from God. It's all from him. And that means when we get past our past and past our history, that's not something that we can do on our own. We cannot overcome our mistakes or make up for them by just going out and trying to do good things. This passage of scripture says that God has reconciled us to himself. And though our sin broke our relationship with him, his love for us gives us victory over that sin, and it makes us right with him. When I was a kid growing up, another little story, that I mean, lots of stories I could tell you about some lies that I told my parents. Grandkids, don't listen to this. Yes, I did lie to my parents a few times when I was growing up. Some little white lies, and actually there were some whopper lies that I told when I was growing up. And then after I became an adult, there's lots of other stories I could tell you about some of the lies that my kids told me. I'm certain they would not like me to share those. Um, And, you know, there's times when I didn't always do what I said I was going to do as a parent. And even though I didn't mean to at the time, not doing the things that you tell your kids that you're going to do, that's a lie is what it is. And so because of all those experiences, when I was growing up and my experiences as a parent, I tell my grandkids today that I would never lie to them. And I believe, by the grace of God, I believe that so far I've lived up to that promise to them. And I hope by the grace of God, I continue to live up to that promise to them. Because, you know, as I look back on my life, I realize that every single one of those lies was a sin. And every lie that was told hurt one of my relationships, whether it was a little damage or a lot of damage. And I really wish that none of those lies had ever happened. But I'm thankful that at a very early age, and I taught my kids this, that they were growing up, I learned to be sorry for the lies that I told, to just apologize and to mean it. You know, because when we do that, it helps us to restore that relationship and it starts to rebuild trust and it reconciles us to the person that we lied to in the first place. And that's what this passage of scripture is telling us, right? When we confess our sins to God, and they're sins against God. I don't care if you've lied to your partner. I don't care if you've done something else that's sinful to another person. Every single sin is against God. It's against God. And when we confess our sins, whatever it is, and we receive his forgiveness, what he gives us is a restored relationship with him. 
Love takes over again and we're, we're made new. And then we become conduits of that love to other people. And so my second point today is I just want to briefly talk about God's love for us and God's love through us. God's love for us and God's love through us. Because Scripture tells us that God is interested in the whole world being reconciled to himself. He doesn't want anybody, none of you here today, none of you that's going to be listening online later, he doesn't want anybody to be weighed down by this life that has this sinful past that we keep hanging on to or this shame or guilt that we have. God extended grace to us through Jesus' death and resurrection. And now we're to be ambassadors to other people. It's just like when we as a country send an ambassador to another country, they're there to represent the United States to that other country. When you are a believer, when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're meant to be an ambassador to other people. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that want to get out there and do a lot of talking, you know, but what people want to see is they want to see you live out your faith in front of them. I've heard it said before, I think I've shared this before, that love for God is better caught than taught. And that is so true. People want to see your faith. They want to see what you do. We can go out and we can tell people all day long about being a Christian. We can share scripture with people, but they want to see what God has done in our lives. They want to see how we demonstrate that our past has been wiped clean. People do not want you to lecture them. They want to see you live a Christian life in front of them. And if they see the joy that comes from knowing God and the freedom that you have from being united with Christ in your life, then they might be drawn to this reconciled life with God as well. So, folks, whether you believe it or not, a love for God, it's contagious. You know, if you're out there demonstrating it by the way you live your life, people cannot help but notice it, and it's contagious. And so they want to see that it means something to you. If I gave you all a chance this morning, I know there's not a lot of you here, but if I gave you all a chance this morning, if I told you, take the next two minutes and turn to the person next to you and tell them about something in your life that was your favorite, you know, like your favorite movie or sports team or family member or something else that you really cared about, I would guess that would probably be pretty easy for all of you to do. And it wouldn't be a challenge because we love talking about the things that are important to us and the things that we cherish in this life. And so we'd probably do it and we'd probably do it with a lot of enthusiasm. Hey, let me tell you about my kids. Let me tell you about my grandkids, whatever is important to us, because we love to do that. But on the other hand, if I told you to tell the person next to you about your last visit to the dentist or the license branch or you had to go see your tax accountant because it's tax season, and I ask you to talk about that, I think it would be a completely different story because that's not very exciting to talk about because our passion is evident when we share the things that we're passionate about. And so when a person really loves someone or really loves something, we can't help but tell other people about it. There's so many people today that walk around and profess to be Christians. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. But you never see it in their lives, and you never see it demonstrated to other people, and you just don't see it in their lives. They come to Sunday morning, and they worship, and they sing the songs, and they do all of the things that good Christians do, and then they leave here, and the rest of the week, you can't tell them from the rest of the people that they encounter in this world. Because if we really love Jesus Christ, we couldn't help but tell other people about it. It should just ooze out of us because of our love for what he did for us. And when we really love God, and his love really does reign in our lives, talking about him and celebrating his love should be second nature for us. And we don't have to go and share scripture and we don't have to do all of the things that you see me do on a Sunday morning or that your Sunday school teacher does. You just go tell your story. 
right? Just go tell what God has done in your life. Share how your past has been forgiven. Let people know who you were before you met Jesus and how you met Jesus and who you are now that he's changed your life. That's what we share with him. Jesus wants this appeal to reach out to the world by the way we live and the things that we say and do. And it's all been made possible through the person of Jesus Christ. Look at the next verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, For he made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus, most of you know this, right? Jesus took our sins, he took our mistakes, he took our brokenness, and he even took all of our past shame and our past guilt, and he nailed it to the cross. When he died on the cross, he became sin on our behalf, my behalf, and your behalf. And even though he was perfect and sinless, he took that burden upon himself. It's because of his sinlessness and his perfection that he was able to do that. And so even though we're all sinners, God loved us so much that that's what he did for every single one of us. So point three, my last point for today, our wrongness, our sinfulness is replaced by God's righteousness. Our wrongness is replaced by God's righteousness. There is this incredible exchange that takes place at the cross of Jesus. I mean, Jesus takes all of our wrong ways of living, all of our sins, throws them away. When we put our complete faith and trust in him, when we're saved, when we're born again, he throws it all away. And what do we get in return? We get the righteousness of God imputed to us. That Greek word behind righteousness is this idea that we are approved in the eyes of God. His righteousness is his divine approval of Dave Zaring and anybody else that is a believer in Jesus Christ. So some of you, as I close today, some of you in this room, maybe some of you that's going to watch online later, maybe needs to hear this. I feel like you need to hear it. But if you're united with Christ, if you're in him, by your profession of faith, then God does not see your sinful past. He chooses not to see it. It's gone. And he looks at us through the lens, the blood of Jesus Christ, and he sees you as forgiven. And it seems too good to be true, but it's exactly what the gospel is. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. One last story I want to close with. I read a story a while back about a company that made cake mixes for sale in the grocery stores. They made these cake mixes, and they thought they were going to be wildly successful because their ingredient list and their instructions were so simple. All you had to do was add water to this cake mix. And so they thought, man, so simple, ingredient list so short, we're going to just be outlandishly successful. To their surprise their sales took a nosedive. Their sales slumped because they didn't sell like they thought they were going to do. And so they thought, well, we better do some research. And they did some, some market research. And what they found was that their customers were uneasy about buying a cake mix that only required water because it seemed too easy. And so the customers thought, well, it's not trustworthy. It's too good to be true is basically what their customers said when they did the market research. So they changed the ingredients. They went back and they changed the instructions, the ingredients, and they added one single egg. One single egg. Water and an egg. Put the cake mixes back on the store shelves. Sales went through the roof. Went through the roof because the cake mix now was successful because people trusted it. And I found, folks, that that's often true with salvation, right? When we tell people that God has forgiven us our past by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, that that's a free gift that's available to people, people will think, well, that's too good to be true. And it's far too simple to trust. And many of us think that we somehow have to add to that 
with the way that we live our lives. We have to add to it with penance for our sins or trying to earn something that's priceless. There's people that will tell you, well, I'm a good person, so therefore I'm going to make it to heaven. But that's not true. It's only because of the blood of Jesus. It's only because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. I don't care how good of a person you are. I don't care how bad of a person you are. All you have to do is accept that free gift and believe that Jesus did this for you. You know, the Bible tells us that you have to put your trust in him. And when you put your trust in him and believe that he did what he did, that he is the son of God, that you're saved. And we don't have to do anything to that. Scripture tells us that all we have to do is simply receive this love of God and allow it to rule over our lives. And then and only then will we experience the joy and the freedom of a new life. But make no mistake, he does change you. He changes you as a result of what happens when you're saved. So God's offering this freedom and that new life to everybody here today. Those of you here in person, those of you online, it's called salvation. We're saved from our old lives. We're saved from an eternal separation from God, and we're made new in Jesus Christ, a free gift. All we have to do is accept it. Most of you here today have done that, but for those of you that haven't, those of you that's listening online, here's what you do. All you got to do is have a simple conversation with God. You tell him that you're sorry. You know, you're sorry for your sins because we're all sinners and that you believe that he sent Jesus, his one and only son, into the world to pay for your sins by dying on that cross, by shedding his blood on a cross, and that through that death, that payment for the penalty for your sin, that's completely paid for. Paid in full is what it is. And if you believe that, and if you're truthful when you tell him that you want him to be the one in charge of your life as best you know how, that you're willing to put your faith and trust in him alone to save you, that instant, this new life is available to you, regardless of your past. And I hope and I pray this morning that every single one of you will make that decision today. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you this morning for what Jesus did on the cross, and I want to thank you for your love that sent him there, his love for us. I want to thank you, Lord, that he loved us enough to leave us and sent his Holy Spirit, sent the Holy Spirit to live in us and to help us as we live this life every single day. Lord, help people to see a change in us. Help us not to just go around and profess to be a Christian and and do a lot of talking, Lord, but help people to see how you've changed every single one of us. I pray, Lord, that if there's any today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, they would realize that it truly is as simple as what it sounds, that it is completely free, and that they would make that decision today. And Lord, I pray for everybody who has made that decision that they would learn to put you first in everything. It's a process that we go through, Lord, but I just pray you would work in each of our lives and help us to be more holy every single day of this life that you've blessed us with. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.